eliminating bad habits after class. And keeping in mind the theme of our Collar Lab convention this year, that Collar Lab is mainstream. Some of the so topics that we have written down today that we would like to try to cover, if at all possible, we don't know whether we can get to all of them as thoroughly as we might like to, but we will try to do the best that we can. We're going to ask that if you have questions to ask, that we hold them until the end of the session, the latter part, last 15 to 20 minutes of our hour and a half, and then we will have questions and answers at that time. So please make notes as you go along or remember what you might like to ask about so we can do that and give our panelists the opportunity to present their ideas. Subjects including styling, dress, cliques, attendance at dances, the dance program and the attitude of the dancer and the caller during that program, banners, round dancing, additional club activities, square directors, and we're speaking of those who direct squares while the dance is going on, bad temperament within the square with regard toward new dancers, Contribute and promote future classes. Timing of the caller and the dancers. Bad habits at festivals and weekends. Weekend institutes we're talking about. To include drinking, dress, and styling. So those are some of the topics that we hope to try to cover. Our panelists this afternoon on my far left is Mr. Harold Fleming. He is from California. He's been square dancing for 28 years. He's been calling for 17 years. He joined Caller Lab in 1975. He calls for three clubs, and he teaches one class per year. Our other panelist is Melton Luttrell, and he is from Texas. He's been square dancing about 30 years. Been calling for about 31. <laughs> No, he's been both square dancing and calling for almost 30 years. He calls for six clubs in our area, plus teaching two square dance classes per year, one in Dallas and one in Fort Worth. And I would dare say that Melton probably teaches more dancers per year than any other caller that I know. I would go as far as to say as he probably teaches more dancers per year than anybody else on a year-round basis. His classes go all year long, and he runs two classes per year at one particular location, averaging approximately 20 squares per class. So you can see by that, and he's been doing this for 20 years at this one location that I know of. He's a gentleman that I've known for a long, long time in square dance calling, and we've done a lot of activity together. I'm going to ask Harold, if he would, to come to the podium and to give his ideas on one of the subjects that we have to talk about and what we're going to do is he's going to give his ideas and then Melton is going to rebut or add to and then Melton will give an idea and Harold will do the same thing and we're going to go through as many of these topics as we possibly can Mr. Harold Fleming Thank you John When John asked me, when I received a letter from him on the subject of eliminating bad habits, I'm quite sure you've all been through the body mechanics, cutting square dance movements, body flow. Myself, I think one of the most important things is when you pick up the mic to become a caller, you automatically become a leader. As a leader, when you cross over that line, you are a director, a guide, a supervisor to the overall program of square dancing. 
the patterns that you set are the ones that your dancers are going to follow. Your dress code, your mechanics within the square dance field of dancing, you're one person on the stage. They're all looking at you. When you make your first direction to the square dancer, that separates you from the dancer and makes you into a leader. I had the question asked, what is a leader? Are you a leader or you are a dictator? Sometimes the two go together. You are dictating movements. And in a way you're showing these dancers the movements that you are dictating. John has listed a bunch of bunch is that the correct word? Whole group. Oh, a whole group. I stand corrected. Of eliminating bad habits. Number one, in your club, the first bad habit is be careful of playing favorites. Be careful of clicks. Avoid criticism. Do not take sides. Be firm and above all be always be truthful. Avoid gossip and troublemakers. Leadership is the most important quality a caller can have. If a caller is fortunate enough to have leadership and the other things that go with it, then he and she can feel blessed. You know, I look over this group. I've been asked on dress, on certain levels, I picture square dancing is a big piece of pie. A 360 degree circle. Within that pie, you have every level of square dancing involved. We may have sections. You've got mainstream, you've got advanced, you've got challenge, you've got round dancing and contras. You may cut a little piece out thinking that this little piece is yours. I want you all to remember, when you put that piece back, you're still within the circle of score dancing. And we ask, as a caller and teacher, that when you look at that piece of pie and you take your section out of it, remember that you're representing square dancing and caller lab and keep that pie in one place. Thank you, John. Uh, regarding leadership, I'd like to make a point or two. Uh, I noticed Harold enlisting your remarks, Harold, and I had not talked to you previously about the fact that you were the context of your speech. And I noticed you brought out some points about don't play favorites. And I suppose that means don't pass anybody by when you're kissing all the girls. Is that what you meant? <laughs> you got to take the bad ones along with the good ones. <laughs> A long time ago when, when Flip and I were younger, and uh, I keep bringing Flip into it, but I feel so close to Flip and John both because we've both been at it a long time in the same area. And... Uh, Flip and I talked about that a lot, and the only way you're going to really get to kiss the good-looking girls is to kiss the others, too, or you don't make anybody mad. So we just try not to miss anybody, and I think that would fit right into the leadership category. Don't miss any of them. If you're going out to work with your students, well, it's up to you as a leader, as Harold says, to, to take the entire class into context. I would just like to emphasize one bit of that, Harold. I, I sometimes wonder if we as callers 
know really what an immense power we wield as leaders. Uh, it sometimes is a bit frightening if you really stop and analyze it. And this was brought home to me very hard recently by a gentleman that I had in my class who is a very, in our area, noted author. He has authored some 50 books, and particularly in the field of uh, marital problems. He's a marriage counselor. He teaches at one of the universities, very prominent uh, person in his field. And he began lessons with us some three years ago. Very slow person to learn because, one, of his age, and two, because of his physical impairment. He has a bad hip and, and walks with a noticeable limp. But uh, he really is fascinated with our activity. And uh, he never fails to come forth sometime during one of our sessions and always bring about the little compliment to me of, uh, and not to me personally, but to the profession as to what an extraordinary amount of power a square dance caller has in his hands. Because he has stated to me, and I have since thought about it, he knows of no other activity where one person can take so many people and have them at his complete will. And he said it's almost frightening of how much power you wield as a square dance caller in your influence over people. And I had sometimes not thought about that as much as I should. But uh, when you really stop and get out into serious thinking about leadership, you can do with your ability as a leader almost anything with those dancers that is in good direction and of good taste. You wield an immense amount of power. And I guess that's why it becomes a bit frustrating to me when I see bad styling habits, when I see so-called Hungarian swings, when I see so many things that you people come into this room or into this convention and say, we have this problem at home. How do I eliminate it? And I say to you, you eliminate it. You have the power to eliminate it. Caller Lab could enforce, as long as it were in good taste, and we certainly are not going to do anything that's in bad taste, I hope. We could enforce any definition in styling, in procedure, almost at will in the entire country within probably three to six months. If we as a body set up ourself, our goal, and our mind to the fact that we can do it. Because we have the power to do it. And it simply boils down to leadership. God, I made the statement one time and I was laughed at, but I'll stand by it. And this is boastful, but I can take a group of dancers and I could tell them that good styling is to put their hands on their knees and dance around. And by God, they'd dance that way. Because they don't know any difference when they're new. You can work with those people. They'll trust you. You gain their trust being a leader and a teacher, and you can teach them. Now, heaven forbid we ever get to anything like that, but we can teach those people good habits, and we can also influence them to change. Now, someone said, my area won't change this particular thing. Damn, we've been doing Hungarian dos I dos and that's what the people want. The people will change. John and I illustrated in two consecutive festivals within the past four months, both very large festivals in different parts of the country, one southern, one western, both places. Immense amount of kicking and everything that I consider not good for the activity, just with one styling clinic in the afternoon. You cannot believe the difference, and we've gotten phone calls and letters that just really are heartwarming. Hey, smell. <laughs> saying that, uh, saying that, you know, we didn't even realize what you had going. No one had bothered to show. And it's just simply because sometimes we, as callers, do not realize we have the potential to do all of the things that are necessary. Now, we've been in every convention for these nine years 
And I have sat in on so many of these meetings, whether it be eliminating bad habits or how do we keep dancers or whatever the title of the meeting, it all boils down to one thing. Every time it boils down to can we influence our convention body that you are leaders. Now, you don't have to hit somebody over the head to be a leader. There are subtle ways to do it. There are all sorts of ways, but it boils down to leadership, and I firmly believe in it. Thank you, Melton. Folks, we have two or three chairs over here on this side, if any of you would care to come sit. Or are you just standing outside watching to see which one's going to fall off of this podium next time? <laughs> I hope everybody noticed last night in the show that we saw Hello Hollywood, Hello, the new square dance costume that we're going to have. It's <laughs> male and female, it's red in color, it's made of braided rope. <laughs> I'm going to put both of these panelists on the spot and I'm going to say this. The first topic that we have on the list is styling. I'm going to say that I'm an advanced square dance caller and I call challenge and I don't care anything about your styling that you teach in the classes, that you teach in mainstream dancing, that you stress and you push and you've got all these definitions that we have. You've got all the styling situations that we have that Caller Lab has adopted. When I call advanced dancing and challenge dancing, my dancers don't like it. They say, if you push styling off on me, we're just going to go dance to somebody else. We don't want it. We're not going to do it. We're not going to dress in square dance costumes, and we don't care anything about your baloney that you have written down in your books. How are you going to convince me to do otherwise? <laughs> John Jones, are you truly an advanced core dance caller? I advance from one town to the next. <laughs> I suppose in the past three years, uh, I have been in more, I hesitate to use the word arguments because sometimes that means you fall out with each other and have ill will between. <clears throat> I'll say heated discussions. I have been in more heated discussions uh, with people who call and uh, teach advance over that one item. And uh, I'm almost as hard-headed as they are. And they're very hard-headed, some of them, and some of them maybe are in this room. And uh, the thing that has happened in square dancing over a long period of time, it has cycled up and down and up and down, largely on choreography. But I can assure you one thing that there is a place in square dancing for all of it. There is an absolute place in our activity for every level, every level of square dancing, be it C1, 2, 3, or what have you, or be it the pure student level, be it conscious. There is a place in this organization for it. But the thing that I cannot understand is why it can't be part of, as Harold says, the same pie all the way through. It's one big pie. We set standards for that pie. And I would not personally care as a pure mainstream and a little bit more caller how many basics we had. I am totally in favor of new basics. I say that unequivocally. I have never sat in a meeting and said restrict the number of basics that we have in square dancing because I feel like they are a necessity. They stimulate the activity. I think it's a beautiful activity to have new basics and new ideas in. But by gosh, we can all do it the same way. That's the only point I've made from the beginning. There is no reason for a student dancer or a teenager. I'll back up to that a minute. We have at home and in different parts of the country very active programs in teens. But for some reason, I hear the excuse, well, they're teens, so they have more energy and they do more kicking. They do more twirling because they're teens, and it's all right if they want to kick over each other's head and do three twirls as they go around. They're teens, and let them go. And I say, no, they're square dancers. If they want to get into a different activity and twirl and kick and get into exercises, that's a different activity. Square dancing is this way. This is the way it is traditionally. We have nurtured it. 
we have done our best to improve it, and that is square dancing, and it should not change. New basic movements that are a part of this activity, wonderful. I'm 100% for them, but I am not for changing one iota of styling from word go. You bring people into class, you teach them how to hold hands, you teach them to stand, you teach them to dance. Now then, if advanced or challenged wants to get into an activity that is not square dancing and have choreography uh, that includes very precise and intricate movements that require no dancing, that it becomes a drill to where to see if you can go from point A to point B without a mistake, then that's fine. But let's don't say it's dancing. Square dancing is dancing. Choreography can be a very beautiful part of it. And I see Lee in the room, and he's a good friend of mine, I hope. And Lee, Lee and I have discussed things heatedly in the past, and he and I have the same basic love and concept of square dancing. My fallout is people who will use the excuse of, well, we can't do this in advanced. We can't do out of man's lips. We slap the left hand. You know it's true, and I know it's true. We can't promenade. We can't do this. We can't do that. I'm not saying Lee or any one particular person does this. I'm saying it is a portion of our habit, just as teenage extraordinary amount of twirling and kicking, just as Hungarian dos sandos is out of style and mainstream. That, it to me, is not dancing. I don't see any reason, John, for you as an advanced caller to not conform. <laughs> One thing I learned, an old note reader. Well, that's yours. Sorry, it's John's. <laughs> you know, there's one thing you have to remember as a leader. You're not going to just go out and say, this is wrong, change it. Right away, you've put a line right across you. He's not going to cross that line, even though he thinks you may be right. I suggest that you say um, something in the order of undress codes, for instance. He may be in shorts, and by the way, I've had a gentleman in the summer show up to my class in shorts, thinking this is his style. I went up and asked him, I said... We have instructed you in the correct dress of square dancing. You may be have you may uh, uh, have a good point on why you're in short. He did have a good point. It was about 115 outside. But I said, you know, I, I have to agree with you for the 115 degree weather. But let's say, for instance, that you're invited to a a formal meeting, you and your partner, written out on this real fancy stationery. What's your first thing that you're going to come? You're sure not going to go there in a bathing suit. Is that right? And most of them agree. In other words, the occasion you know how to dress, and you wouldn't change it. When you go to church, you don't go in a bathing suit because you know what the code of dress is to go to church. When you go to square dancing, you know what the code and what we stand for in square dancing. Look at the overall picture, not just for yourself within the, within the square dance code. If, ask yourself, do you want your dancers to pull, jerk, jump up and down in place? Is that styling? Is that the way that the dress codes and everything would fit in together to form a pattern? Are you practicing shortcuts? Short courtesy turns, and I've seen four varieties. Hand claps for alum and lefts. 
no, mentioned Hungarian swings? Or do they dance each movement correctly? We were at a meeting some time ago and Mr. Davis, Bill Davis was conducting it and one of the young callers said, I have a problem, Mr. Davis. How do you, in, how do you eliminate a Hungarian swing? And Bill says, easy, I don't call it. Thank you, Harold. No, these were my notes that were laying up here. Uh, I think y'all might have convinced me. Actually, I don't guess there's any two callers in the world that think any more alike in that regard than Melton and I do because we have known one another for so long, but we didn't teach each other these types of things that we're talking about. I actually learned mine from old-timer Ray Smith, who's still very active in the activity, and he's been around for a long, long time. He's a very poor dancer himself, and I wouldn't say anything to his back that I wouldn't say to his face because he's about six foot four and weigh about 250 pounds, and he can still squash me if he wanted to. He's even bigger than Vaughn Parrish. But he is a great teacher of styling and uh, good dancing habits and techniques and that type of thing, and I will always admire him for that. It bothers me as a square dance caller to have to get up on the floor and say, without hands, do a do si do Or without hands, weave the ring. I guess we're developing a new call when we have that type of thing, but that's some of the bad habits that our new dancers get into as soon as they get out of class and walk out on the dance floor and see some of the club members who've been around for quite some time or a very short period of time, perhaps only a year. And all at once they're doing these type of things, and they look at you and they say, why didn't you teach us that if that's what they're doing on the dance floor? And so you back off and say, well, that's what they're going to do anyway, so I guess I may as well just let them go ahead and do it. Boy, you got the tail wagging the dog, in my opinion. And I'm just as strong on it as Melton is, and maybe even more so. He pounds on the podium a little bit. I just talk louder. But uh, it's one of the best parts of our activity that I think we should maintain and keep up with, and I think it should be carried on into the advanced and challenged program, and I challenge those callers who are in that program to start on their own, to start doing that. I've had some of them tell me that uh, they have mentioned it to their dancers, and they've asked their dancers to do it, and they said, no, we're not going to do it, and if you insist, we're just going to go dance to somebody else. I challenge them all to get together and all start at the same time and start working on it, and I believe it can be done. I know it can be done. I would like to take a couple of more subjects and lump them together, gentlemen, if I may, please. The next one is clicks, and I know you run into this when dancers get out of class and they go into club, and all at once you've asked the dancers to come into your club and you've gotten their money. And they've joined the club, and all at once club members won't dance with them. They start forming their own squares and let the new dancers get in the square in the back, and they break down that stuff, and you know, just keep on on calling, caller. Call a plus two dance, but we haven't taught them all the mainstream program yet. And so we won't dance with them once we've got their money. That creates situations of clicks. The other one, one topic, the other one is dance program and attitude. And the third one I'd like for you to cover that is pertaining to the same types of topics is square directors within a square and bad temperament. Yeah. yeah, I got a few thoughts on everything. I don't mind sharing them. Square directors are, uh, and just to clarify, so in case anyone missed what John was talking about, as a teacher, I'm sure you've all experienced it. We have what some people are formerly called angels to come to class and assist, and there are good and bad points about that, and I'll not go into that particularly to say that I know it does exist and I know you know it exists. And uh, after a class, and there comes the, the difference in the efficiency or the uh, ability of the dancers to apply their skills as a square dancer. And it always leads to one person leading the other person through that's having a bit of trouble. Now then, I really don't see anything wrong, because I'm sure I'm as guilty as the other, so I wouldn't want to criticize myself unjustly. If dancing in a square, and if someone turns the wrong way, and you are absolutely sure you're right, to reach out and take the hand and give a little slight correction and go that way. 
But what I really oppose, and I think is an extremely bad habit in square dancing, is to see someone that is actually directing or teaching in the square while you are calling. And it just... It just is impossible in my way of thinking for there to be two teachers or two focal points of attention at one time. If the caller is to be the focal point of attention by his right of being the caller and owning the microphone, then he is the one that should be listened to by the dancer and not to the person in the square who, either right or wrong in his own judgment, and I'm sure giving a defense to those type people that they mean well. I honestly think all the people who get in a square and are going to assist the other people through mean well, but they sometimes don't realize that the harm they do in distracting that particular dancer from the subject. If they would just merely sit and listen, they would probably allow the person who is having trouble to gain a better skill as a square dancer in that respect. So I use the little uh, standard speech that's been practiced over several years You know, I said uh, every time we start a class, for example, with helpers who already dance, I said, I appreciate your being here, but my first message is to those of you who are here is that you are to be a good dancer and not any sort of a teacher in this class. And those efforts will be appreciated by me and by those who are around you. If you will just simply put yourself in the right place at the right time and stand there very patiently and wait for the beginner who is struggling to adjust his own thinking to get into that position and listen to the caller direct him there, you will be of the most service to that student and to me in that manner. So I think we can eliminate a lot of those people not by belittling them but merely by informing them as to their job how they can best serve the square dance, either in class or in the dance itself. And I think they're they're nice people, and most will respond to the little bit of niceness you put to that message. If you'll just simply sort of save them up a little bit, I appreciate your efforts, but, you know, please let me teach, and you just be there at the right place at the right time, and it'll help that student immensely. Uh, I'm not for sure that I really understood the point of bad temperament. Do you, do you mean, John, the, the effect? Uh, an experienced dancer getting mad at a new dancer for not being able to complete the call. Of well, yes. Uh, what John was saying, if you didn't hear, was uh, he wanted me to address the subject of bad temperament, meaning one square dancer being bad at an, mad or angry or showing some display of angry emotion at another square dancer who fails to perform up to his level. Yes, our new dancer. Well, I, I think it goes without saying that's not in good taste. In fact, it's just not good at all. So any any subject matter in your classes or in your dances could be addressed to that just very directly, you know, by saying, hey, gang, you know, this is here for fun. We're all in it together. We did not come here to put on a, a team to win any prize for getting anywhere first place or doing it better than anybody else. And we're all in it together. And part of the enjoyment of square dancing in particular in class is making the mistake and finally realizing you made it and how to correct it and get back and laugh about it and let it all be done. In fact, I'm quite sure that some of the more enjoyable squares I've seen on the floor where I've danced are people who did make a mistake and recovered. So any temperament displays is completely out of order in my mind. Clicks. <laughs> clicks. He asked that I address the subject of clicks. Now, are you sure you're the moderator on this thing? <laughs> I want your views here. Clicks. Uh, uh, yes, we got them. We always have had them. We always will have them. Uh, I use a, uh, I'm just relating personal experiences, incidentally. I'm not smart enough to get out and tell anybody what is really properly done, right or wrong, other than through my own experience. And I, through those many years of having taught, uh, have experienced that just as you have. And uh, I don't know any way to eliminate it completely. That is utopia. But I would say that there is a way you can control it. And it's the little ploy that I use is if you're going to have a click, as is inevitable, have a big one where nobody notices. Don't have a four-couple click. Don't have an eight-couple click. Have you about a good old 16-square click. And then you can mess around all night and nobody's ever going to know the difference. Just have a big one. So. 
Charlie's chair up here. Or right over. There's two or three more chairs over here. A couple over here on the left. You know, I have to agree with what this gentleman said, and he's had a lot of experience in this field. I'm quite sure that within the advanced level and the challenge level, I've never really had a show of hands. How many here use the Ballard system? Just raise your hands uh, that are in the advanced or the challenge level. Thank you. The Ballard system, for those that haven't had the pleasure of working with it, is a system... Where does this gentleman... Art Ballard. From where? Northeast somewhere. Oh, okay. Where? Peabody, Massachusetts. You, you, said, you said it. I never... What it is, you go in and you're assigned a number. And we have a scale on a chart with a slide rule. Your number is on this slide rule. You look at the slide rule and the number corresponding to it tells you what square you're in at that tip. And that's moved. I just... If anybody got any ideas later on when we open it for general discussion, if there was some way we could just bring this in to all levels, what it does, what it does, it makes the strong with the weak and the weak with the strong. It makes all your squares practically the same level of dancing. It's definitely one way of eliminating clicks. That's right. It sets all the squares. What we do, though, because we don't want to take away everything, we usually let them set their first square and their last. Um, but one of the best things in the world I found that when you go up and say, you can't have that click there, everybody wants to be a caller, even though, or a showman, or a, a leader, even your dancer wants to be one. I found out that if there's a so-called click, I go down and tell him, gee, Bill, I sure need your help. You're a terrific dancer. Could you just, this one tip kind of help me over in this other square, and they need a little help, and I know you can do it. Praise is the greatest thing in the world. Make them believe that they're teaching, but you got to remember, let me do the talking, and you do the demonstrating. To me... If you can build a dancer's ego up big enough, they'll almost do anything for you. And I still say this is part of leadership. Okay. Thank you, Harold. You don't have to applaud them every time. You keep applauding these guys every time they finish one of these topics. They may think they're getting good. <laughs> you know, we noticed that last night in the, in the show that the part of the program where the ladies came out in the really beautiful Southern Belle costumes carrying the little umbrellas and the flumed hats, beautiful costumes. And then the couple came out dressed in Navy-type uniforms to dance, you know, and the lady that probably didn't have one ounce of fat on her body doing the dance that she did. And when it was completed, her dance was completed, we decided that that was all position dancing. <laughs> The true definition of it. And then when the gentleman with the crossbows finished the last act that he did and he shot all five of those crossbows, one in succession, one right behind the other, that was C5. <laughs> I would like to ask each of you two more subjects at this particular time. And I think they relate together. And they, I'm sorry, they don't really write, relate together, but to keep you from jumping up and down out of the chair. Does timing of a caller help or hinder bad habits after class? The other one is, how do we handle bad habits at festivals and weekends? The topics that I mentioned a while ago. Drinking, dress, and styling at weekends and or festivals. Those two things, gentlemen, if you would. Harold, would you go first? Timing first, and then bad habits at festivals and weekends, including drinking, dress, and styling. 
You are the guest caller at a weekend, but you're also the caller for timing after the class, a caller's timing of his calls. All position dancing. I think that's the greatest uh, illustration right there, timing. Believe me, especially the guy with the arrow. Timing at festivals, we all know that timing is, is a very important element in square dancing. It takes so many beats to do a movement. And I'm sure that you know that by putting these figures together in a timing sort of way so they all flow. Sometimes I've been to a dance at a caller and I've danced three hours and you know I said this is a terrific dance but I'm give out. I, I, I really don't know what it is. I know what it is. The timing isn't quite there. Uh, John says how do you eliminate bad timing I'm sorry but I have to go back to the same thing bad timing originates from the caller caller goes back to leadership I, I still feel that this is what we are I think timing is a key to score dancing if you're three beats late in giving a demand you've got a muddle out there and you can tell it if you're three beats or four beats ahead that's fine. Just don't get too far ahead. Drinking, styling, and dress at weekends. I believe that goes back to the first time that you took those dancers on the floor. And there's one thing I always caution the dancers. Remember that when you're out at a festival number one you're not only representing square dancing number two you know the code of ethics number three you're representing yourself your club and your caller I had a little note here that I scribble down and you as a caller does your dress code does your dress compare with others are you a leader and are you dressed right because the dancer more or less plays follow the leader can you honestly say to yourself all the good king all the good things come from you B, the bad things must come from somebody else. Can you say that? Are you proud or ashamed to tell others that those are your dancers? That puts you on the spot. Remember, they're representing not only your area, your club, but you as a caller. So, gentlemen, we better straighten up our act. on and it'll probably continue to go on as an extracurricular activity. What I'm speaking of is dance, uh, drinking during and or immediately before the dance activity. I'd like to uh, uh, correct in my mind at least uh, something Harold said. I, I, I hope it was not interpreted. I know what he meant and I hope it got across to you. Uh, Harold mentioned in the subject of timing that it, the muddle the square, I believe is the word he used, or muddle the square, uh, stacked up if the timing were late and uh, if it were a few beats early, it was all right. Now, I think what he was really addressing, and I'm not trying to correct him, I'm just trying to amplify a little bit on that, if I may, Harold, is uh, what I think of as timing is the number of beats required to execute the basic. And I think you were talking about the point 
of the, the delivery of the command prior to the execution of that command. In other words, the prompting sequence, if you were, and uh, certainly uh, how far ahead by how many beats or split seconds or what have you that you deliver a command before the actual execution of that basic is desired is not as objectionable as being late. And I think that's the point that uh, you were making, is it not? Yes. And of course now on the subject of timing, when John addressed that a minute ago as being a subject or a bad habit that we could speak about, I had in my mind the, the true timing aspect. And to me, that goes along with the cardinal sins of, of bad styling. And I'm talking about from a personal standpoint. I, I can't think of a word that uh, comes to mind very quickly that is strong enough for me to say how I detest bad timing. I think it is a very, very root of a lot of our evils in square dancing bad habits. I'm talking about the dance habits on the floor itself. Uh, every square dance basic is defined by this convention in the past few years very carefully worded through the work of a lot of people on various committees and there has also been a lot of work put forth on the timing committee and it's not really difficult to time a square dance all you have to do is dance it and see what you do is you dance every movement as if you were circling left because there's no difference the beats the same. It takes so many beats of music to do each one of those movements comfortably. And when you start trying to eliminate some of the corners and everything, you result in bad timing. Uh, I detest, not the caller, certainly not the caller, but I detest seeing that the fact that some callers don't realize, in my mind, some of the bad habits they get in with timing. Make an ocean wave and balance and swing through. Square through four hands around, do a dos side do, get all the way around, make an ocean wave and balance and swing through with the two by two. And where was the four counts for the balance? Timing means allowing so many beats to do each fundamental properly. And when you don't have it, then you get this jerky, herky stuff and you get all these substitutes for nice dancing. John, I know, for example, and I guess we're patting each other a little bit on the back, and he gets up and makes all the nice remarks about to me, and I'll have to take a little aside here. John, say I scared to death when you introduced me because I never know what to expect. He knows both sides of me, and he presented the nicer side this morning, and I appreciate that. Uh, and I sometimes address the nicer side of him. And one of the nicer things I could say about him is that John insists in his classes on being a very firm uh, well, I should back up. Being a very d good disciple of Ray Smith, he has learned well, and he uses the very strong, stern approach that you will do it this way, and it works for him very beautifully. And one of the things he does, he insists on the correct definition of the basic as it is taught and written, and he also insists on the timing and the styling be applied at the very instant he teaches it. So he starts from ground one with basic definition, basic styling, and basic timing, and I have seen him use beautifully little bitty records that some people wouldn't even think have any merit in today's square dance activity, old type records with good music, to teach grand square, teacup chain, forwards and backs and everything where they have the exact number of beats and they learn to dance with beauty and grace through timing. So I think it's very essential. So all I would address to that, the other subject was eliminating the bad habits you felt in uh, some of the square dance Weekend institutes, for example, or festivals, etc., where particularly uh, uh, you mentioned drinking takes place and dress and styling. Thank you. Uh, calling again on just my own personal experiences, I think is I'm right in saying that uh, I'm 21 years into the square dance weekend business now. Through a promotional standpoint, we do, I believe, it's five a year, and. Uh, I would have to say that they have been reasonably successful for us. And uh, I guess I would be uh, kidding myself if I say some of that did not exist in our weekends. But uh, we have tried to control it to the best we can and, and taking them more or less one at a time. Uh, since my whole livelihood in square dancing depends on smooth dancing and people enjoying what they do, and I truly believe they do, 
is we try to make that a part of our weekend from the very first by the letters we send out and address those people. That, in fact, uh, I can almost quote it, not for word, but most, is that our reputation as a square dance weekend promoter for many festivals has been built up through our emphasis on smooth styling and dancing. And we would wish that if you are to attend this weekend, that you would keep that in mind and do us the courtesy for both the staff and the, your fellow round dancers and square dancers to follow through with those particular principles. So I don't know that that helps, but I know we don't have much of it after we get there. It usually works out pretty good. Uh, Charlie Proctor's here, and has, I've worked very closely with Charlie for several years from the round dance aspect of it. And I might put a little aside in there. I can't think of anything that's going to smooth up or make square dancers nicer than also putting those people into some early round dance classes and letting them learn that part of the program as they come through. I think it's very essential that in your square dance class you promote the goodwill and the principles that round dancing also applies to our activity. It will really help smooth those people out. We have the drinking problem because people are just going to drink alcoholic beverages. Uh, in, uh, I know ministers that drink, you know, I know <laughs> people who are of all religions and walks of life who drink, so that's a part of our activity, uh, our very makeup of our life. But we are very firm in our, in our regulations that we do not allow it during our square dance, actual dance activities. We just do not. But it's very difficult to take 100 couples, for example, or 200 to a hotel where you house those people together and feed them together and their room is only down the hall from the dance floor. It's very difficult for them not to go back to their room after the square dance is over and have themselves an after-dinner drink or before-dinner drink or whatever it may be. I don't think you're ever going to eliminate that, but just the mere nature of our rules and regulations pretty well keep it in line on the floor. And if there are places that that gets out of line, then I think we would go back to the leadership qualities qualities that were stressed earlier that we should stress to eliminate that just by asserting ourselves as leaders and saying you can go to your room and drink all you want but we do not bring alcoholic beverages to the floor nor do we intend for you to come down here having consumed those ahead of time thank you uh, uh, harold you had said you had another comment on timing please come around here I'm quite sure that most of you do it, but some of you, one of the greatest things that I think on timing is, and it fits in with the pie that we started first, is contra dancing. Now, I can't tell you about the late Bill Kastner that I've had the pleasure of having down at my clubs. I don't know a triple, duple, and all that stuff. But the very fundamentals of contra dancing in your beginner classes is the greatest thing in the world for teaching timing. One other thing on, on timing, and I'm sure you all can, if you see your dancers cutting something short, add just a little something to it that will make the shortness a little bit out of place. So... Think of that little bit when you see some dancer. Don't go up and say, you can't do that. Believe me, work it in so they don't even know you've done it. Thank you, Harold. And a personal experience that I had with a square dance weekend that has been very successful for us along with two other callers. One thing that I found with new dancers is that when we graduate a new class, and one of the earliest things we like for them to do in many cases is to go with us on a weekend outing somewhere. You know, you haven't really lived until you've gone on a weekend thing. So we get them to go, and the first thing that they see is some people dragging out the alcoholic beverages and the beer that they've been trained for the past year not to do. And so that's one of the things that we need to look at. We need to tell those new dancers before we go to the weekend that this is a part of our life because you probably do it at home. And so the people carry their own, but we still ask them not to do it immediately before nor during the dance activities that we have. I think that's one of the things that we as a caller should be responsible for to make sure that it is done, whether it's done by us or one of the leaders in our club, to make sure that the word gets around to the new dancer. 
because I can imagine that me as a new dancer and seeing that, and I say, well, boy, he's been telling us all year we can't do that, and man, as soon as we get graduated and go to a weekend, we can do it. So we'll quit going to the club and dancing. We won't go back to the class. We'll just make the weekends. <laughs> It'll be more fun. Yeah. But uh, we can handle that type of situation, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, personal experience at a weekend we have, and it was brought to my attention that one particular man had been drinking quite heavily on the dance floor the night before. It was a Friday night, Saturday, two sessions, or three sessions on Saturday and Sunday morning type weekend. So on Friday night it was brought to my attention that he had been drinking quite a bit, and so we began watching the next day. The next day he particularly did not show up for either of the workshops that we had during the day. And that night during the Saturday night dance, and the three of us callers happened to be calling at the same time on a tip, and I happened to be looking in this particular man's direction when all at once uh, with the peripheral vision that we callers have out of the corner of my eye, I saw some movement that was not proper or was different from what was going on at the time. And it looked like these two men were playing a game and doing a grand square. And I looked around at the caller who was calling, and I knew he had not called a grand square. So I knew then that they were doing something different. And then all at once I saw this one man shove this guy back into his own square. It happened to be the man that we were talking about. And, of course, then I looked, and we've got some 70 squares of dancers on the floor. And I thought, oh, gee, we're fixing to have a fight right in the middle of this square dance here tonight, and, and I'm going to be in the middle of it because I'll have to separate it or stop it. Fortunately, when the tip was over, well, the man that was looking at me, all I could see was his face, and he was smiling. Well, what he was trying to do was get this guy to turn him loose because he had him by the collar and had him up completely off the floor. He's quite a bit bigger. Well, what I found out later was I went and talked to this man, and he said that every time he danced by in the adjacent square, he reached over and pulled his shirt tail out of his pants and just laughed like heck. Well, a couple of times, you know, it was all right. And he said, after seven times, I'd had all of it I was going to take. I wasn't going to permit it anymore because he said I could smell the alcohol on his breath and I simply wasn't going to have it done not to me. Well, I knew this man and I knew what his profession was. Square dancing was an avocation, but he was a deputy sheriff in one of the adjacent counties. And had we been in his county, he would have arrested him on the spot and hauled him off the floor, probably handcuffed. Now, that would have been a heck of a thing for us to have to stand there and watch because he'd had to drug him all the way across the floor to get him out, you know, and everybody would have seen it. So as soon as it was, a, was over with and we discussed it and we didn't know how to handle it, I started to go get the guy and tell him to leave and give him his money back and tell him to get out. We did not want him there. But we decided that later that night that we would make the announcement, and we did. I, I have to digress just a moment, if I may. It actually happened on Friday night, the first night of our weekend, and not on Saturday night. And then when he didn't show up all day Saturday, then that night I made the announcement. I got elected to make the announcement that there will be no drinking on the dance floor at our weekend. I don't know of anything in the world that will break up a square dance activity any quicker than alcoholic beverages, and it'll darn sure do it. Now, I'll go have a drink with you when it's over with and, and probably stay as long as you do. I won't drink as much, I don't imagine, but I'll have one with you. But don't bring it on the dance floor and don't let your people do it. If you ever let it get started, it's one of the toughest things in the world to stop, and I guarantee you it'll split up any type of square dance activity that we've got going. Because you cannot drink and square dance as we all know, and so we can't back off of that type of thing. We can't back off of any of the things that we keep talking about. We stress it and we push it on our new dancers and we talk about it all through our classes. We don't ever give up on it until they graduate and then we say, well, they're not mine anymore. Well, they darn sure are. As long as they're dancing to your calling, they're your dancers. You don't have to dictate, you have to lead. There's a difference between a leader and a dictator. And it depends on how good a leader you are as to whether you can continue to lead your dancers to not do these things that you know they're not supposed to do. The, one of the styling situations that Melton was talking about, and we got asked to do these, we did not go in and say, we are going to do a styling session for you, whether you like it or not. We got asked to do it. When we go out and call festivals and this type of thing, we probably don't say a word about styling and what have you unless we're asked to do so because we don't want to offend anyone. I don't want to go into an area and offend any dancer nor offend any caller. But if I'm asked my opinion, I'll darn sure give it. And <laughs> I've got one opinion, and that's the way it's written in our books that we have and, and what we have written. 
But this one particular one that we did, we did a styling session for 50 squares for two and a half hours, Melton and I did. We were asked to do that. After that two and a half hours was over with, then we did a two-hour workshop. And all 50 squares stayed there. That was probably the longest session that I've ever done at one time in in uh, my calling career. But Melton and I alternated what we did all the way through the styling session for these 50 squares. We still had 50 squares on the floor. We didn't do a two-and-a-half-hour continuous thing. No, we took a, I think we gave them one intermission <laughs> somewhere along the line. But after it was over with, I think Melton and I got one of the longest ovations that we've ever had in square dancing. And that's really appreciative to us when we find that type of situation. And we have had two phone calls from those people in that area that they have set up and developed styling situations. The dancers have gone to the callers and said, this is what we want you to do. And so it's coming back into an area where it used to be one of the strongest points in that area, and they let it get away from them. We've gotten so involved in choreography and basics that we've forgotten to teach square dancing all the way through. This little dangle that I've got hanging on my badge right here, uh, it cost me 50 cents to get it, but uh, Herb Engender had them when we came in, and I found out when I read back through part of the Caller Lab history that we have that this is the first sentence that the original group that got together in 1972, that was the first uh, direction that they gave themselves, and it stands for the letters all the way across the sentence, let's put the dance back in square dancing. And I hope we can. We've got just about 20 minutes, and I would like to do this. One thing I meant to do earlier, and I forgot to, from the National Executive Committee and the National Square Dance Convention, we have Mr. Ken Parker in the room. Ken, would you mind standing up so everybody can see who you are? Thank you for being here. And from around the lab, and also a very good friend of mine in Melton's because he comes from our area. We've known him ever since he's been square dancing. He tried to call at one time, found out he couldn't sing worth a hoot. So he wound up teaching round dancing, and he's here representing round the lab. Mr. Charlie Proctor, would you please stand up? <laughs> We're going to take just another minute, in about two minutes, guys, if you would. And round dancing is in our picture, and it's very strong in our picture. And, Charlie, I'm not doing this just because you were in here. It's one of the topics that we already had written down on our program. What? How can we eliminate bad habits with regard to square dancing after class, or are there any bad habits? One comment that has been made in our area, and this has been coming up, and I know Charlie knows about this, that we have some of the round dance instructors in our area that are saying we're not going to cue rounds for your club or your special dance unless we can do two rounds between tips. Comments, please. Well, I can very positive comments on that also. And uh, I feel from the very first, round dancing is a basic part of our activity. Because in most of the things that I read in uh, literature involving our activity, it says square and round dancing. In fact, our association at home is North Texas Square and Round Dancing Association. And I think you find most of them are that way. It's an integral part of the picture. And from, from the very first night, I think it should be stressed that that is a part of our activity and a very nice part of it. Now, I, for one, being primarily a square dance caller, uh, but one who is at least active somewhat in rounds, I can sort of see both sides of the picture. I, for one, have never, I resolve to you unequivocally, have never had that problem with a round dance instructor. Now, maybe I'm running into the wrong kind or something. No one has ever come up and demanded that they do two rounds between tips. But what it is is I am something of a taskmaster at my square dances and at my classes. And I teach hard, I teach long, I square dance call long and hard tips, and they're ready for a little rest in between. And I really don't mind a bit if they want to do two rounds, if, if they will do it within the time allotted. I feel like that there is an awfully lot of wasted time in between square dance tips. I feel like that in most places somebody goes over and they jar around and I've seen callers who drive me batty with all the dead time in between. Now I think we ought to be using that time productively with for people on the floor. So we sort of use the rule at home and with the people with whom I work and with Charlie that I don't set the rule on that. We play it by ear. Sometimes we do one, sometimes we do two. And the round dance callers with whom I work have the expertise and the good judgment to know when it's good to do one and two. You just sort of get a feel for it. 
and I think it would be wrong, and I don't know what Charlie's opinions are, but I think I know. Uh, I don't think he'd ever demand that. I think he has enough good judgment about him to know that there are times when if you have a short tip, and it just seems to set the pattern, to let's take a short break and get back into it again. But there's times when, hey, we need to slow things down here a little from the square dance angle. Let's just take about one minute's rest, and then let's put on two quick rounds, one directly behind the other, a nice waltz, and then a peppy number or something like that, and I think it works beautifully. And I sort of hate to get into these patterns where it just has to be. I sometimes do three singing calls. I mean, three, well, see, I've done that too. I sometimes do three calls to a tip, and I don't want anybody to tell me that I can or cannot do it. I've called by judgment, and uh, I feel like I have been successful enough in my own mind, and that's an easy way to judge, incidentally. I've often made this statement. If you're a square dance caller and you're worried about whether you're making it or not, that's not a difficult way to find out. You know very easily. You know the people tell you whether you're making it or not. If you got crowds coming, you're okay. If you're not, then you start looking for reasons. Okay? In our area, I know I'm not the only one, but I still am one that teaches the basic square dance round and cues them at the clubs that I call for. It's becoming a little tougher to do with the, uh, the amount of time involved in square dancing now. I, for one, agree with Milt. Double or singles. Myself prefer doubles. And the reason I do, because I think... And, it, what it, and the way this works is for those, in the first one we have a, uh, a round dancers round, and then we have a square dance round. And I think some of the most beautiful dances are written within the, the round dance field, and also the score dancing. I need a little break, and I continually try to explain to the dancers that they think the two rounds are cutting them short, and I time them time after time after time. Gang, you're getting an extra tip or two in. We're not cutting anything off. And believe me, round dancing belongs with square dancing. It's still part of that pie. Thank you very much, Harold. And before we open it up for questions and answers, and we've hit Charlie with this uh, situation that we have, and I know he has some very definite feelings about these types of things. And, Charlie, I'd like to ask you if you'd make a couple of comments, please. Thank you, John. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to say a word or two. I'd like to very, very briefly tell you a tiny bit about our association between the three of us, because then you'll understand my comments a little bit better. Melton and I have been doing a, you often hear of square and round dance weekends. We have been doing a round and square dance weekend together since the early 1960s with a leaning primarily to round dancing with some square dancing. Uh, I also have worked with him on other institutes that he has uh, that are square and run as weekends. Our association has been long and very, very pleasant. John is also more involved in run dancing than most of you would care to know or would, would expect, I would, that you would be expected to know. He has at national conventions done an introduction to rounds for square dancers, and both of them cue quite, a, quite often in the round dance field. So they are round dance oriented. We're very close friends. Fortunately, we're all from the same area. The <laughs> John don't smile very much, but other than that, he's okay. <laughs> it, would be, it would be terribly, terribly presumptuous for any round dance leader, from my point of view, to go into any square dance hall and insist on having his way about one or two rounds. This is about as silly a thing as could ever occur. The square dance caller, round dance leader function has got to be extremely close-knit and cooperative or it will not succeed. If I were a caller and a round dance person came to me and said, I will not cue at your club unless I can do two rounds, I would tell him goodbye. Truthfully, I would tell him goodbye. If he asked me to, whether I should play one or two, and I do that all the time. That's part of what I do. Nine times out of ten, they say, whatever seems right at the minute. I asked Melton this three weeks ago at Frank Lane Dance. I said, what do we do, Melton? I forgot. Do we play one or two? Whatever you want to do. Whatever makes good sense at the time. Isn't that neat? 
Isn't that neat? This is the way it should be. We both want the same final result from that dance. We want the people to go home saying, gee, wasn't it a great dance? They, they won't really remember whether you played one round every time or two rounds every time. They remember they had a great dance. And you must capture the feel for what's going on in the room when you're doing this at that very dance. Most of the time I played one. One time I played either three or four. Refreshments were going on and they were lined up. And so we played some during the refreshment break. And then we went back to playing one again. And that's the way we do it. You have to make your dance program make sense to the flavor of the mood that's in the room at the minute. Appreciate the opportunity to make the comments. Thank you very much, Charlie. Questions? Get them back. I'll have to repeat the question. I don't think we have another microphone out so everybody can hear it, so it'll be on the tape. For the benefit of the tape, the panelists just got praised. Do you have something else? I don't want that to be left off the tape. Yeah. My name is Bill Gibson from Southern California. And uh, back to the click situation, if I may ask you a question. Um, you said that the uh, Southern How can you stop the leaders of the club from making decisions that are not with, uh, do not pertain to the entire club as a whole? Did I state that close enough for the as the question? How do we deal with it? Either panelist. I'm closer to the mic, and I've always got something to say, whether it's good or bad. Uh, that's a very interesting concept, and I've seen that happen in a lot of places. And uh, first of all, I would uh, counter this with one point. Some of the more successful square dance clubs that I know are operated very tightly by a small group of people. So from that standpoint, that sometimes is not all that bad. Uh, I sometimes feel if you get into an open meeting and you discuss whether you're going to bring ham sandwiches to the club picnic or whether we'll bring peanut butter, it arises into a major problem which can be unresolved. And it sometimes is better to take the attitude of a small governing board. Governing board is better and more efficient way to operate a square dance club. But if you're saying that this small clique persists in, in, in their signs that show uh, how could I state that well if you're saying that it becomes a click out in the dance activity itself with those four couples where they dance together for example uh, and just continue to do everything together uh, I'm afraid I don't really have an answer for that because you as a caller who is a guest I presume could not have much input to that particular organization if you were a permanent caller, you'd have more of a say-so, being a probably a member of the board or at least a, a source to whom they would go to for advice. But if you're just strictly a guest caller for that organization, I sort of take the rule, again, calling on my own experiences, that when you're in Rome, sort of do as Romans do. You know, you don't rock the boat. I'm not about to go up and be critical of any group that hires me to come and be their guest, whether it be a caller a guest caller or a guest of any nature. But, uh, you know, if I'm actively pursuing that particular club as, a, as an advisor or something, then I would certainly have some comments to make. Thank you. 
says, I would like him to do such and such to be. Now, what I'm saying is, oftentimes what he's telling me is what kind of situation may not be in the best interest of the remainder of the other floor. So he may be asking me to call QS when it is, it is apparent that the floor can only maintain mainstream. And he is making it a large decision for the overall floor, or the overall membership of this club. And that's that's going to give you a little more information. That situation was, uh, for the benefit of the tape, that you're asked to do things that, in your judgment, the floor cannot handle. I wouldn't do it. If I'm going to be a caller and a leader, I'm not going to do it. Now, I'd go to him and tell him I don't believe the floor can handle it. I'll test them out just a little bit, and I'll let you know whether they can or not. But if I feel like they can't, I ain't going to do it. I think it's your responsibility as a caller. Now, if they don't like it, then I wouldn't go back and call for them anymore. Then you callers are going to have to get together, and you're going to have to get your dance leaders together, and you got one of them sitting right back there by you, and Ken Parker, and I imagine he can advise you about as much what's going on in the dance picture as anybody else. So sit down and talk. Breakdown in communication is the biggest problem we got in the whole world. With A1 communication, you ain't got any problem in nothing. I don't care what it is. Harry Truman made a comment one time, and I firmly believe in it. I believe in the American people, and I believe they'll straighten the situation out. Let them go far enough, and they'll hang themselves with whatever thing they might be doing wrong. <laughs> I've got to let someone else speak. We've got another question over here. Uh, Harold, I wanted to know if you did use the Ballard system in the beginner class. Do you use the Ballard system in beginner classes, Harold? Do you want me to honest? On it, be, you, you, all you have to say is yes or no. You don't have to get no. He says no. He said he does not use the Ballard system in class. I do. Works great in class have problems outside in the outside activities. In, in some of the other dances, we have some dancers that have rebelled against the ballad system out in class. They, they said they don't want to, a square dance caller's not going to tell me what to do. They've, they, they've forgot that we started telling them what to do from the day they stepped up on the dance floor. Been telling them what to do for years. But you got to lead them into it. You can't make anybody do nothing. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Same situation. Does anyone else have a question? I'm not trying to ignore you, but I want to give someone else a chance. To, over here on my left, please. Bob Marks, Newport, Michigan, Florida. I do use the system all the way from classes on up. I work with the five classes in about 12 workshops a week. But I do have a question to Melvin Lundgren. Melvin, you stated that we can enforce any styling rule, but we have to have a styling rule in color lab that our state... Colors Association. I brought it up for a vote that was voted down 240 to 1 on Palms Up versus our. Our problem is that we have people coming from the north, from our northern areas, that are all used to Palms Up. Then from the New England area, we get the arm down. And the poor people are going like this. Is there anything we can do to get Caller Lab to address the situation in that particular area and see if we can iron out anything? So we would have it coming the same no matter where we're at. Thank you. you want me to answer that? I'll be glad to answer. Uh, now, I'm Melton just turned to me and he said, go ahead and answer it. Uh, the question is, <laughs> the, the question is, in the state of Florida, you have a problem because your state callers association uh, has voted to dance in the forearm position rather than the hands-up position as described by Caller Lab. And how can Caller Lab address that situation? Caller Lab will probably not address that situation other than the fact that what we've already written, because our original resolution was that we were not dictators and we could not dictate. All we could do is set examples and write the definitions and styling as they should be. The callers have got to get together and do it themselves. Now, I've said this to you guys down in Florida before, and I'll say it again, and I'll say it to any other group of callers. The callers have got to get together. But if you are an alone situation, you cannot fight the battle by yourself. But I know darn well we have other Caller Lab members in Florida, and we all belong to the same organization, and they should all get together. Now, many situations have been mentioned to us, and what you just said about the robot-type situation of the hands up and hands down, that's what brought it about to begin with, and Melton Luttrell and I were the ones that introduced it and forced the issue in St. Louis at our first convention because we in the Midwest... We're hitting that situation. California was dancing hands up, and the East Coast was dancing forearms. And we in our area were dancing around like we was trying to flag an airplane down. 
And so we were catching it right in the middle, and we said, for goodness sakes, look like we could get together and decide on one situation one way or another. And it doesn't make any difference what it is if we can all agree. And all we got to do is agree to agree and then go home and do it. I, d- I just want to amplify that, and as this is repeating things, and I, I should not be repeating what John says, but I'm going to. I firmly believe, sir, and I honestly firmly believe it. I cannot emphasize how much I believe it, that you... And your fellow square dance callers could teach those people to dance with hands up within six months without any problems at all. I firmly believe that. If you would just, and I don't mean you because you're probably here listening and, and trying to do your part, but I mean all of you would get together and say, do we want to be a part of the overall picture or do we want to sit here in Florida or wherever this state happens to be and be our own thing? Now, it's a matter of working together. And I can promise you, when John and I came here nine years ago, we firmly resolved, be it up or be it down, we would go back and convert our area to that style. It went up, and we had to give up some other things. But it can be done. I know it can. I guess we're the lucky ones, because we're in the state of California that has palms up. But I believe that Color Lab... When, they, when this was originally formed, and you all know there's no way that you're going to get, what's the membership right now, 1,200 or 1,400 callers and to go right down that single guideline. It is a guideline. We, we, we know that you're going to detour a little bit from it. But if we don't stick together as callers in Caller Lab and teach our newer dancers this way, the, the one thing that I remember John said about three meetings ago, three years ago, he said, if you've got anything to say, say it here, and don't start bad-mouthing it after we get out of this association. The, one of the biggest things that Frankie Lane had to give up to follow that line was, well, was snaparoo. And he gave it up because he had to give a little bit, and I think we all do. So some of you guys, come on, let's, let's, let's follow that line and keep that pie together. Callers and dancers can get together and do anything they want to. All they got to do is be in agreement with each other. It's very easy. Question? Al? Yes, before we, before we break up, I know I'm trying to say right here that the thing is, everything is right to the same, but not all the callers belong to call the lab. And this is the problem that we're finding in our area. Because those people that don't belong to call the lab are the ones that are going out and allowing the parents to let those who don't, allowing the kids. Until we can get them to go with this, we're always going to have this problem. And that's The comment was that all callers do not belong to Caller Lab, and we certainly know that. All callers don't belong to their local callers associations, and we know that. But what we've got to do is try to entice them in some manner to get them to be a part of us. Not that we're trying to dictate to anybody. Caller Lab is not a union by any means. It's a place that we can all come and sit and visit and get to know each other and talk about the problems that we have. And hopefully someday we'll see an answer to all these problems that we've got. I rather doubt it, but hopefully. Yeah, we can, but we, if we ever give up and don't continue to work for it, it's just like eliminating bad cl- habits after class. If we don't keep working on it, we got bad habits forever that we'll never get rid of, so we've got to keep working in that direction. I would like to...